Welcome to the Life with Grief podcast. I'm your host, grief and transformational life coach and fellow griever, Tara Accardo. Welcome back to the Life with Grief podcast, you guys. Today's guest is such a force of nature and an inspirational voice in the grief space. I am so excited to share this episode with you all today. I've really been looking forward to this one because if you know her content, even just from social media or her books, you know how vulnerable and honest this guest is, which I think we always need more of when we're coping with grief. Whitney Lynn Allen is first and foremost a mama to her sons, Jackson and Leo, and she actually practiced law as a medical malpractice defensive attorney for 10 years before her husband had a severe reaction to a bee sting and sustained a severe brain injury, which subsequently resulted in his death. Since then, Whitney decided to turn her pain into purpose and followed her new calling to serve others who are also experiencing grief and trauma and she shares her vulnerable and very personal grieving journey with others. She's also the author of Running in Trauma Stilettos, which is an Amazon bestseller, and also just released another book called What Must Be Carried. Whitney is also a certified grief educator and provides grief coaching to those who are ready for their own transformation and growth after loss. She shares the empowering message that there is so much beauty in life, even after losing a loved one. And this is an ideology that I am so, so aligned with and speaks to everything I do here at Losses Become Gains and here on the podcast. And I am truly just so honored to share Whitney's story and uplifting perspective with you here. So without further ado, let's get into it. Whitney, welcome to the Life with Grief podcast. I am so honored to have you here today. We have been in talks for a little while. I'm so excited to finally have this conversation and dig into this with you because you have one of the most heartbreaking and just wild stories of of loss that I've really come across. But I really resonate with you so much because I, I first, of course, came across you just like on Instagram and seeing a lot of your content and so much of it. I was like, oh, my God, even though our, our losses are very different, just your approach to grief and life after loss and and navigating it all is very, very aligned with mine. Um, and I just see a lot of my myself in you. So I'm just really excited to have this conversation and just leave people here today feeling just a little more hopeful and like, you know, they can still live a really beautiful and vibrant and, and full life after loss when it feels like we can't (laughs) very often. Um, and you have just suffered one of the most devastating losses that a person can go through. So before we get into all of that, I just wanted to welcome you. And I love to kind of start our episodes just with you telling everyone just a little bit about yourself, but even things that you like to do for fun or hobbies you have, or, you know, whatever you would like to share, um, just so everyone can get to know you a little better. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and I hope, um, I hope the people listening get so much out of this. Uh, but to answer your question, to introduce myself, my name is Whitney Lynn Allen. Um, I am a mom. I have two sons, um, Jackson, who is six and Leo, who is two. I think that's like my first, like my most important role in life Mm -hmm. is being a mom. Um, And I'm also a grief coach. So I help people after life altering losses, um, cope and figure out how to kind of move forward in their life after loss. Um, You know, whether you're a widow or, you know, you've lost somebody you love, I help people kind of navigate that. Um, I'm an author. I published a book in February of 2020. My gosh, it's like two um, or February 23. And I have another book coming out at the beginning of 2025, um, which is really exciting. So I am a writer and I also share about grief and life after loss online. Um, In terms of things that I really like to do, I love working out. I've become like really fond of yoga. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I really like to balance kind of the more like intense exercises with slowing down, which is why I think yoga is really important. I think it's really good for people that have also been through trauma, kind of regulate your nervous system, which has helped me in a lot of ways. Um, And I like reading and writing and doing all the things um, 
you know, that I do on like a day-to-day -day basis to kind of share with the world about, uh, what I do and how I help people. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Like I was saying, your, your content really in my eyes is, is very raw. It's very relatable. And you really touch on topics that I think, I don't, I don't want to say controversial, but th that are so they're, it really touches people. And I think people have a lot of thoughts and feelings and things, but you, you address things that need to be addressed and that are difficult to talk about sometimes. And especially with your journey in, in losing a partner, and I don't want to take away from you. I'm going to hand it off to you in a second to, yeah. to tell your story, but there are so many nuances and so many things that have to be unpacked right after we, we lose someone. And yes, some of these things are uncomfortable to speak about, or, you know, it's, it's, there are things that we might all think or feel, but we just need to normalize it more. So it feels just a little less isolating and just lonely of a process. And I can only imagine, um, the, some of the isolation and things that you, you might have felt, um, when, when your partner did pass away. So I want to hand it off to you, uh, please, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing, just your, your journey of, of loss and grief as well. Yeah. So, um, it's like a, and I was like, where to start? <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. Um, so yes, I am, I am a widow. So I, my husband Ryan died in April of 2022. Um, and then, so six months before that, that kind of caused his death was that he got stung by a bee in October of 2021, suffered a really terrible reaction. So anaphylaxis. Um, that caused his heart to stop. So he went into cardiac arrest and that caused an anoxic brain injury, which is when your brain is deprived of oxygen for an extended period of time. Um, so he did survive, although he did suffer a very severe brain injury. Um, and we, you know, we tried to kind of rehab him to see if he could recover. Um, and his body was really strong. Um, except that his brain could not recover. So, you know, his doctors, when he was in rehab after a, around like the five month mark, uh, basically told us like, there's, this is impossible for him to have a meaningful life. Like even if he's able to come out of the vegetative state that he was in, mm -hmm. you know, that still doesn't look like having a life that, you know, you're able to interact with people and be able to feed himself and walk and like do mm -hmm. all these things and be aware of what's happening around you. Sure. Um, so we made the decision. So myself and, and Ryan's family to put him on hospice, which was obviously a very, I always say it was like the hardest and the easiest decision because, yeah. you know, I knew what Ryan would want and what he wouldn't want. Um, but, you know, getting to that point, we were like, oh, I have to say goodbye to like this physical person that I love so much. Um, that's really hard, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't in the form that he would want to be in to be on this earth. Yeah. So he died, he was on hospice for 22 days and he died on April 7, 2022. Um, and that, I guess <laughs> my yeah. grief journey really started when he had his medical event or his accident. I don't, yeah. people get weird when I say accident. So I kind of, <laughs> I say both now. One of um, those triggering things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, so, you know, I was really not really starting to process until he was, he, he died because yeah. there was so much trauma and just when you're in it, you're just trying to, to get through the day. I was also pregnant when his medical event happened. So I was dealing with like being pregnant, being postpartum, um, having my husband on hospice. So it's like, you're just suspended in the state of, oh, I need to survive like autopilot. So I don't think I was able to really have anything catch up to me until after he actually passed away. Um, although I was grieving him for the time period between his medical event and, and when he died. Um, and after that, obviously, yeah. but, you know, I had kind of, I say, I lived kind of a charmed life before Ryan's accident. I didn't really have a lot of trauma. I didn't really have a lot of death in my life. I was really fortunate. Um, not a lot of out of order deaths going on like mm -hmm. grandparents, but mm -hmm. things that you would expect as, you know, a young adult. Mm -hmm. um, so this really shattered my entire world. 
And I realized this experience is not at all what I would have anticipated. The feelings that I had were very surprising. They were shocking. They were scary. And I realized like, we don't talk about this enough. And if there are other people that are experiencing this, like I feel so alone, they must feel so alone in this. Why aren't people talking about this experience of grief and trauma? So it felt like people asked me like, why, why do this? Right? Like, it's so hard to I get that talk question. about like death and grief all the time. And like, yeah. your well, husband's I guess it's so death depressing and, like, and sad. I'm just like, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like, I, and I guess, yes, it is. It is a hard topic. However, you know, somebody has to talk about it. And I felt really compelled to share my story with other people because I felt like this isn't just an event that happened to me. Like this now feels like my mission in life. Like my new purpose in life is to educate people on this experience so they don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the only way I can explain it. It's just like, I felt called to do this thing (laughs) that felt bigger than myself. Yeah, absolutely. That's so beautiful. I, I, feel the same way as far as how I was sort of called to do this and just mentioned like you were in a very different career at one point Mm -hmm. right can you just talk about that and then like your journey to become a a grief coach and how you started your journey yeah so uh I was I still am a lawyer like I'm still you know like registered licensed (laughs) um but I'm not practicing so I was a medical malpractice defense attorney for almost a decade before Ryan's medical event. Yeah, right. Can you talk to me a little bit about, because I I know there's a lot of listeners here that deal with or are dealing with or have dealt with anticipatory grief. So Mm -hmm. whether they are in that right now or they perhaps have had a loved one, you know, transition, die, um, and they are now trying to like catch up with that a little bit because you said it so beautifully and I have definitely been there myself twice where Mm -hmm. you, you almost, you, you are in such a survival mode. You are in such Mm -hmm. a state. It is such a state of shock. You, you said it well, like you're kind of just suspended. There's like this, this limbo, if you will. Um, you've already talked a little bit about this, but like in that anticipatory grief, maybe looking back on it now, maybe it was, it was hard to even understand this as it was happening, but what did you do to cope with that? Are there any like tools or is there anything that you remember helping you just like keep your head above water a little bit or was it truly just like I am just doing the bare bones minimum like the best that I can because I going through what I have I did not have children at the time so I Mm -hmm. can only begin to imagine that added layer of just I I don't know that that complexity right emotionally physically how taxing all of that must have been so what yeah was that like for you and and ultimately what sort of helped you survive on a day-to-day? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. And I, you know, I think during that time period between Ryan's accident or medical event and like his death, it's, I, I didn't, I didn't have the privilege to access any tools or, mm-hmm. you know, coping mechanisms, like at least ones that were supportive. I think it was really just, I was, you know, going through a traumatic event. So my body and mind were like, oh, you are not going to feel this. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was really numb for a lot of it. And I think that's, you know, that's so true for others going through trauma. It's like, it's, yeah, like it's so heavy and it's Mm -hmm. so painful that your brain's like, oh, we're going to just shut this down right now. So you can literally survive. Like you can be alive because if you're you know, your body and mind allowed you to kind of have those rush of like hormones and chemicals through your body. It probably, like, it probably wouldn't be able to even survive. Right. Um, right. You know, which is why, you know, people have a lot of like <laughs> physical ailments that happen from trauma that are real, like things with your heart, things with your immune system, things yeah. with your like gastrointestinal system, yeah. things with your head. I mean, your mental health. I mean, it, it's, it's real. So I think in that state, I was able to survive because, um, my brain was protecting me and I was really numb for a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. And protecting your, your children too, I'm sure. I mean, so yeah, talk to me a little bit about, you know, after his death, what, how, how did you, 
and I say this loosely, pick up the pieces after that. What did that journey look like for you to, this is a very broad question, I know, but just to sort of get to the place that you're at now. Um, and I also want to touch on, you know, the dating again and <laughs> sort of getting back out there because I do, I do know for sure there's definitely people in my community that um, have also lost a partner either way, mm -hmm. husband, wife, whatever, um, that are trying to figure out how to do that, how to feel okay with it. Um, so I'd love to get there eventually, but at first, mm -hmm. what did that look like for you, you know, now here with two very young children, um, and just trying to, to navigate that? Yeah, it's like the most difficult, uh, it, it's, it's really hard. And, um, you know, I'm so blessed that I did have my children, although, you know, it was more difficult to kind of like be able to grieve and have that space and time to just like be because I was so oh. I needed to take care of two little like a baby and a toddler. Yeah. Um, but it was my biggest reason to get out of bed in the morning is my biggest reason to like get out of the house. It was my, you know, I really just focused on like, how can I be here for my kids and like be the best mom I can, even though I am struggling. Yeah. Um, and I just started, I think like instinctually, I also, I had obviously had grief therapists, like trauma therapists that I worked with. So it's all these very intentional actions, um, starting to put in a movement routine. Like I could have a place for all of these like energetic emotions to go, whether that was anger or guilt or sadness or what, you know, all of the gambit of emotions that we feel after we lose somebody we love. I needed a container for that. And exercise for me was something that helped me so much in my life before, you know, just be on like a, an even keel level. And yeah. um, when your nervous system is so dysregulated from trauma, yeah. it really needs those anchors. Mm -hmm. um, so I think instinctually, I just, I leaned into the things that helped me before. Um, one was movement. I really started, uh, you know, writing, journaling, um, and that kind of snowballed into to sharing online. Um, you know, what I have built now, the community that I have now, is not at all something that I had predicted, even wanted. It was really an outlet for me. It was it was like my own therapeutic, cathartic experience. Just like, you know, I was just sharing it with the world at the same time that I was doing it for myself. Yeah. Um, so all of these very like small, they seem so trivial, intentional actions every single day that helped with my healing, that helped with, you know, supportive of my dysregulated nervous system um, and just trying to feel those little glimpses of hope and peace and joy again. Um, that's really what I leaned into. Yeah, that's beautiful advice. That's very much the guidance that I give too. I mean, it really is such a, a moment at a time, a day at a time journey. And, you know, I, I think for, for me personally, like the two hardest times of day, which is very common, you know, going to bed at night and you have those ruminating thoughts yeah. and yeah. you know, they're not there next to you or they're, you know, mm -hmm. just you're processing the day, <laughs> or maybe, especially if you have kids, maybe you finally have a moment to like, you know, mm -hmm. it's just you or if they're in bed or whatever, and you're just trying to like comprehend it all. Um, and I know that can be very difficult for people's just like falling asleep, but then the morning too, right? Like getting up and, and realizing they're not there. You're just hit with it over and over and over again. And of course, you know, with time, although I would not say time alone heals all wounds, there is a lot that goes into that. You know, of course yeah. with time, our, our brain catches up with our reality. We, we get accustomed to them logically, you know, right? Like not being here, our brain knows that, um, yeah even though we have to sort of update those prediction patterns, like, okay, they're not going to walk in the door at X, Y, Z time of day or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think setting ourselves up for, I'm going to say set ourselves up for success each day, as much as we can, whatever success even looks like to mm -hmm. a griever on that particular day. And it can be the smallest thing. Like it, success does not have to be right. <laughs> like absolute pure joy. Like that's not like, oh, yeah. keeping it very <laughs> realistic. And like, yeah, actually, let me ask you, like, how did you sort of keep it realistic for yourself? Like, did you find that you were giving yourself grace in this time, like whether on purpose or on accident, where you just kind of like, I'm just doing the best I can? Or do you remember kind of like what that thought process was for you? 
Yeah, I think I like that. That's some, one of the things that a lot of my clients have struggled with, like struggle with is leaning into that grace and, um, you know, tenderness with yourself, because this mm -hmm. is such a incredibly painful experience to go through and learn how to live without your person is, yeah. is not easy. It's, it's a forever challenge. Um, and I think for me, I was forced to give myself a lot of grace just because of the season I was in with like really little kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so I surrender to it. You know, I had to give myself a lot of grace, like, and also I think another tip that is really good for people that are going through a loss, it's just like, instead of thinking as grief as a journey, which I, you know, I describe it as a journey too, but I think it's more helpful to view it as an experience. Whereas like every day you come to it and there's no judgment around how you feel. Like if you had to cry that day, like if you had a, even had a good day, cause there's shame and guilt around even having a good day. Yeah. Like you come to your experience, like a practice, like almost like a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. And what, however you show up in the world that day, you know, you tend to that, whatever that experience is and just surrender to the fact that this is, this is what's happening. This is how I feel. And this is how I'm going to care for myself through this day, through this moment, through this experience of life. Mm -hmm. um, instead of thinking yeah, it's like a journey, because sometimes when we think of a journey, we think of a destination. And we also think of like right. this ascending, um, you know, mm -hmm. regression and progression. Yeah. So I don't really like that because that inevitably kind of like that mindset might set people up to feel like they're failing if they're having like a more griefy, heavy day. That makes total sense. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, I hear it all the time where there's, there's certainly outside factors or people that might say, you know, aren't you over it by now? In fact, I had somebody, I think just like comment on something I posted and they were like, I just lost my partner like six months ago. And mm -hmm. it was like someone very close to them were like, you should kind of be getting over it by now or, you know, that very classic. Yeah. I was like, okay. six months ago, what? Like, yeah. no, no ma'am, I will, I am here for you. <laughs> this community is here for you. If the people around you just have these very, I don't want to say skewed, unrealistic, whatever expectations of, of it, right? We're all on mm -hmm. our own timeline and everything. So um, I think that's just such a, that's a really great perspective. That's a very healthy way of looking at it. And I think it, it does help with that surrendering and that giving ourselves grace because we often feel like it, whether it's self-imposed or imposed by other people or just or our job or whatever, or, or having kids, like we just, we feel so responsible to have to show up in the world in certain ways or put like a certain mask on because mm -hmm. we can't lose it at work or we can't, you know, we just have to like he's strong all the time right. so often and you know let's it, it just it doesn't give us that that opportunity and that gift to just to grieve and to <laughs> sit sit with our grief and just witness it yeah I I yeah I like that point I mean it's either I feel like there's people that either are on in the camp that oh like you need to move like move forward quickly you know like you should be over it mm -hmm. or it's like the people that want you to like outwardly be like mourning um yes. forever yeah, that's another so it's like point. I think you get like the two different camps you can't win it's just no. like there's no happy medium it's like we can't just like have this and and the, I think the problem is grief is such an internal experience and sometimes it doesn't it can't match up with the external right because like you yes. said we have societal expectations we have to go to work we have to make money we have to like interact with people especially if we have kids we're picking them up from school we're we're like doing the activities like yeah a lot of the time <laughs> the experience of grief is like you are putting it's very um you know it's like you're acting you're putting it on yeah. a show a lot of the time yeah. so it's like what the people in the world are seeing is not really your internal experience of what's actually happening. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like that can just lead to like more exhaustion too. I definitely, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I I personally felt that in my grieving experience and how uh, just having, yeah, just having to show up or be a certain way. Or I worked at a, a marketing agency at the time and show up on client calls and they were very understanding. Like everyone was very like cognizant of the fact that I had just lost a parent or two, <laughs> depending on when it was. But um, I still felt the need to like keep it together. And, and mm -hmm. I was, I was so drained yeah. by the end of the day, just cause you're not yourself. You're not, you know, yeah. allowing that to come yeah. through. So it's, it's a very, 
Very difficult balance, but I think this is a great segue into what mm -hmm. I was alluding to earlier. I would, again, whatever you're comfortable with, just talking about how you opened yourself up to, to dating again, and you are now engaged and just, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to just, you know, talk about that journey, that, that experience and, and when it felt yeah. right for you to do that and, and just prefacing it, like, it's so different for everybody. I was just speaking with another, um, person in, in the grief space and mm -hmm. she, she was mentioning like when she knew she was ready and it was within months of her partner dying. And for some people mm -hmm. that might sound fast or, Again, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, yeah. But yeah. What was what was that like for you? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think you're ever going to feel ready. You mm -hmm. know, I think, um, I think it's just something that I always call it like, you know, like the nauseousness test. Like if something makes you so ill that you just, you just can't, can't even, even like fathom it, like, maybe like let's put a hold on whatever you're thinking about doing like whether that comes to dating whether that comes to going through your loved one thing things whether that like He's comes to moving yeah. like you don't have to do anything right now like put a pause on it if it makes you ill like okay love that <laughs> um but for me it was more I, I you know it's not like I was like oh I'm so ready to date like I'm mm -hmm. so ready to like get back to out there I was more so curious I'm mm -hmm. like so what does the dating like what do men my age or people in that are seeking a partner in this day and age like what does that even look like who are the people that are um out in the world that are looking for you know like single men um mm -hmm. and it wasn't I had no expectations I I simply wanted I was curious like what what does this what will this feel like Mm -hmm. I also think it's okay to want to date for many different reasons as a widow or widower you can date for me I felt like I just wanted a break from mm -hmm. not like feeling like myself from being in my trauma being in my grief like I wanted to feel alive again um I wanted a night where somebody didn't look at me as a widow and like what I like projected like what I had been through on me because every time in people's eyes it was like all they saw was death <laughs> like that's what yeah. I saw in their eyes projecting towards me yeah. I'm like I need to have somebody that won't look at me like that sees me for me yeah yeah just like and like that's part of it me. sure but like not you know can get get around some of that too yeah <laughs> yeah sure. because you it you know when also because Ryan was because of who he was in the community and because his story like really went viral, like it was all over just because of the nature of um, what happened and how random it was. And then also I started sharing updates and like the updates went viral. It became like very public, right? So mm -hmm. I was having to put on like the charade almost like daily because mm -hmm. I had to smile and I had to hug people and I had to shake hands and it became like almost like a politician like oh endeavor. Yeah. Um, and it was exhausting. I just like wanted a break <laughs> um, from, from that. Um, so, you know, like I said, not that I was like ready to date, but mm -hmm. I explored, you know, what that looks like. And for me, I didn't expect to find somebody that kind of just like made sense in my world um, that really just had so much of my like morals and you know, like foundational things that I really respect. And it kind of just like happened very organically without me, even, you know, it, without any expectations. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I feel like that's a great, like, I was gonna say lesson, but I just, I feel like that's a great way to approach grief in general and just like anything that might come in and out of our life. And I, I love what you were saying before, sort of that, like that nauseous test where like, <laughs> that's like I've never heard anyone refer to it that way, but that's very much like, what I've done, you mentioned like, you know, getting rid of our loved ones, belongings and things like that. And I've talked about that here on the podcast a little before too. Like if it like is devastating to you to, to even think about getting rid of something that then, okay, then now is not the time, you know, it's going to continue unfolding and meeting new people or making new friends or whatever, I think is like a beautiful example of that, or it's a perfect, um, yeah, just a perfect example of that. And can you talk to me a little bit about too, just like how you have, cause I I've, I've seen you post about this and I think it's amazing. And just like how you have integrated 
uh, Brian into your life and just like, you know, having photos of him up and things like that? Like, and how does that kind of now work with the partner that you're with? And how does he feel about all of that? Because I'm sure some people are kind of like, how does one integrate both while, you know, honoring the loved one that is passed on and any new relationships we might have? Yeah, I think that's always, it's like an unfolding thing, right? Like just how in every, everyone's physical space, like there are transitions in life. Like as you're going yeah. through life, like the physical environment kind of changes as yeah. you are growing, as your family is growing. I think for us, like it's, it's always moving, right? So right now I think you're thinking about a post that I like just posted about like, you know, some of the pictures that are around our home now that we share, like I share with my fiance. Mm -hmm. Um, so in, you know, many of the rooms of our home, like there are pictures of Ryan, obviously in my children's rooms, because it's very important for, for them, yeah. like to know this is, you know, this is their dad. Like they have, I, I say like they have two fathers, right. Yeah. Um, they have a daddy in heaven and, and a daddy here. And that's how I describe it. We call them like daddy Anthony and daddy Ryan. I was wondering about that. How, yeah. And how you just speak to your <laughs> children about, about this too. And they're still young. So. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't something that again, it was, it was organic because the little one, the baby is, you know, they are very intuitive and like, he mm -hmm. just really naturally started calling Anthony daddy. It's the only dad he's ever yeah. really known. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my older son, like he kind of goes between daddy, Anthony and, and, um, and Anthony, because it's, you mm -hmm. know, his experience is different. So it's like, we always just follow their lead on kind of how they, you know, perceive things and how they mm -hmm. want to they like what they want to call him. Um, but mm -hmm. I like to, I like to honor like our past. I like to honor the present and I like to honor our future. And I think that that's just what feels comfortable for us. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to approach it. I mean, that's really all we can do at the end of the day, right? Like we, we didn't ask for some of these losses that we, we go through. It is just a part of our life experience and yeah. And actually this is a great segue into sort of my next question, just as far as the work that you do now. And, um, I love what you say, uh, you're sort of a, a cross between a, a grief and a life coach. And again, I really mm -hmm. resonate with that because I, I feel like that's where I, I err on the side of too. And I think a lot of people really see those two things very, very differently. Um, which makes sense. And because they, they seem like two very different things. Right. But mm -hmm. I don't know my, and I'm, I'm curious about your perspective, but my perspective is they're, they're really very intertwined. And I even joked to myself, like earlier on in this podcast, I would, you know, people would come on and be like, you know, tell me who you are a little outside of your losses. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Like, it's very, mm -hmm. it's a part of us or, or it has like yeah. with you, like it has completely shifted your whole career and, and so many aspects of your life that you would not be doing right now or, or even have if Ryan had not passed away. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, talk to me a little bit about like, just, just your perspective on how grief and life are very intertwined like that, because really, you know, like I was alluding to in the beginning, it's your message is very much just like, you know, you can still have a very magical and joyful and purposeful life that is, that is here present, that is awaiting you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's okay. And it's okay to explore that and get curious about that and find that. So I would love to just, you know, hear your perspective on, on that. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, it's, I, I think you're right. I think people like a grief coach, people think kind of like, oh, we're just going to talk about the grief. We're going to talk about the trauma, like go into the past. But honestly, I mean, I think so much of healing and moving forward is kind of looking forward into the future and, and not you know, perseverating over all of these terrible traumas that have happened to you. Like, obviously we have to process them, right? Like we have to process them in whatever way somebody feels like they are able to give those parts of themselves, like the time and space that they need in order to, you know, surrender to them and be like, okay, I can, I can now kind of, you know, integrate this into who I am. Um, without it overwhelming me, without it consuming me, which is what early grief really feels like before it's integrated into, you know, mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but really like the living part is just as important as the grieving part. You can't just do one without the other, mm -hmm. right? Because then that's like, 
you're not, you're not learning how to live in a world without your person. If you're also not doing the living part and you can't do the integration part without the grieving. So it's like each kind of needs its, its due time. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people come to me because they need to find that balance. Like maybe they're grieving, like they're all they're doing is grieving and being in the pain yeah. and they haven't learned like, what does living look like for me? And then some people are like, all I'm doing is like distracting myself from being in the pain. Mm -hmm. And like, they're doing a really good job living, but then they're not, they're not really grieving and you need both in order to really truly feel like you're moving forward. Um, yeah. So you know, the life coach part is kind of like, okay, we need to, we need to have an identity outside of what has happened to us mm -hmm. and move forward, create this life around a pain that can only be carried, um, cannot be extinguished. And you have to learn how to, how to live as well while carrying the pain that can never be extinguished. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I definitely feel like there's a, there's a difference between, I've heard this a few times, but like, you know, there's a difference between like just existing and living and really, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like that's what that, that really living incorporates. It's, it's the, how it's the, okay, how do I get up and do this every day? And that is very much yeah. like as grief coaches, as we are, like, that is where we can really help people. And, you know, definitely if therapy or counseling or something is, is necessary for people to help process trauma or, or kind of, um, like, I feel like that's sort of the difference too. Like, I don't know how your take on this, but like, I feel like mm -hmm. we're very like, okay, here's present and like almost a little future focused. Whereas, you know, therapy and counseling, we're not, they go deeper, <laughs> right? Like there's, yeah. there's a little more, you know, we're not necessarily like licensed or whatever to, to dig into some mm -hmm. of that. Um, but for anybody looking for, you know, just that support, that guidance, that, uh, sitting there with you and, but also yeah. like reflecting things back and asking questions and ultimately allowing and empowering people to get there on their own, right? While feeling supported um, and not like, it, you know, just taking a little bit of the overwhelm <laughs> out of it too, I think, um, mm -hmm. because it can be very overwhelming. Um, and so I want to really talk about uh, your book as well. So running mm -hmm. in trauma stiletto. So I, you, you mentioned yeah. you have a new one coming, so no need to talk about mm -hmm. that if you can't or don't want to yet. But um, how did your existing book come to fruition? Uh, I know mm -hmm. it sounds like journaling and like writing has been really big for you. And I can even just see that again in your content and, and your captions are very thoughtful and just very beautifully worded. Um, but yeah, just talk to us a little bit about the book, how it came to fruition and what people can, um, you know, find when they read it. Yeah. So Freddie and trauma stilettos, it was, you know, this kind of came about in the same way that the grief co coaching came about is it just felt, I felt really called to write about the experience that I had mm -hmm. just gone through and it also felt like something I didn't want to wait to write because I wanted to write it when I was really in like the mm -hmm. darkness of my grief, like in the mm -hmm. visceral part of grief, because I feel like, and I felt like it would have been a totally different book if I had waited because sure. um, I wouldn't have remembered like how some of these things feel, right? Yes, like the heaviness and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like even now when, you know, I'm almost like three years out, it's hard to access a lot of like that early grief stuff. Like I can yeah. kind of remember, but I don't, I, I almost can't access this, like access that anymore. So I'm glad that I wrote it when I did. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, I started writing like almost right after Ryan died. I'm like, I need to write about this experience. And, you know, I think part of it was for me, cause it's just cathartic to write out you know, this is what I went through. These are, this is how mm -hmm. kind of processing, like what I've been through. Yeah. I think it was kind of the beginning of that processing for me, but it was also another chance for me to share a story in a real and raw way. And in a way that I don't feel that many people share because they, mm -hmm. they don't want to, like, it's uncomfortable to share yeah. some of this stuff. Um, and I didn't want I didn't want to not share the really hard stuff. I wanted to share everything because those are the things that I have found that people really resonate with are the really hard things that no mm -hmm. one talks about. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it is, it's a memoir. So it's exactly 
kind of like my life with Brian before his medical event, like what happened, like the medical event itself. And then it takes you through, you know, his death and then just a little bit after. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, this will all be linked in the show notes, of course, but um, yeah, I, I really empathize with what you said as far as like writing being very, very cathartic. That's ultimately how I started losses become gains too, is with a blog, but um, you know, it, yeah, I mean, it helps with the processing. And even if you don't have like a destination or, or you, you're, you don't even know what you're writing or if it can even turn into anything, like not even going into it with any expectations and just really just zero expectations with grief in general. I feel like it's a pretty yeah. good way to approach yeah. it. Like just take the pressure mm-hmm. off, you know, however we can. Um, so as we kind of start to finish up, one thing that mm-hmm. I, I think you are just, you you preach in such a great way is just like, you know, taking your power back, taking your life back a little bit when the unimaginable, when the tragic happens, you know, we have listeners here that are all over the spectrum in terms of where they're at in their yeah. life, but just high level, if someone, let's just say they're listening today and they're struggling, whether they're earlier mm-hmm. on or they're just having a rough go, or it's something has happened recently that has sort of brought some things up. What are maybe just like a couple action stuff, however, however many you want to mention. Um, we, we've already talked about some of these today. You know, it sounds like exercise and movement is really big for you. Um, yeah. Writing. So you're welcome to elaborate on that or just anything else today, action steps that they could take away and put into practice in their life right now um, mm-hmm. that could could be beneficial and help them just, you know, thrive in their grief a little bit. Because I know that that's your... Um, that's also very much your message too, right? You know, we're, we're surviving, we're even thriving maybe all while moving forward yeah. with, with peace and joy and laughter and all these things that we feel like we're not going to be able to feel ever again <laughs> when we go through something difficult. Yeah. So I think it's so, you know, it's kind of our instinct to when our world shatters is we do feel really out of control, right? Like we mm-hmm. feel like things are just happening to us. Um, we feel helpless. We feel like we've lost, you know, our safety nets, our security, um, things that make sense just don't make sense anymore. So I always, right. Like I always encourage my clients, especially, you know, like from beginning of grief to even like years out from grief. Um, you know, I talk about taking control of the controllables. So Mm -hmm. specifically, you know, the bookends of your day um, are really important because life is going to happen. Um, You know, life isn't going to stop being hard because people die, right? Like Mm -hmm. my husband died and I still have really hard things happen to me every day that I have to deal with, um, that I have to learn how to cope with. And I could let, I could have let his death like completely you know, shatter me in a sense where I can't cope or manage with any stressors in my life. And that, yeah. that's a real, that's always a real possibility for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you can do is think about what are the things that I can do in my day, especially like in the morning to set myself up for, like you said, success, um, what I call anchor. So mm-hmm. if that is movement, if that's journaling, if that's just sitting still with yourself, um, it's, if that's making your bed, if that's just getting ready for the day, I mean, things that just make you feel like you're accomplishing something, it builds confidence, it helps with identity, it helps with structure and routine, all these things that we feel like we lose when we, um, suffer a loss. Like those are how you kind of take back control of your life. And it's always the little things that matter. It's not this huge transformation. Mm -hmm. It's not an on or off switch. It's the everyday, almost seemingly trivial activities that are going to be the things that change your life in this experience. Um, So focusing on like the bookends of your day, like how am I starting my day? How am I ending my day intentionally? So you can be really supportive of whatever experience you're going through. Yeah. I love that. That's Perfect advice <laughs> to end on. And I, <laughs> like you said, I mean, as far as like starting your day, like it's, it can be one of the hardest times as I was mentioning, but I do feel like if you can do your best, and I know that is that's really hard sometimes depending on the day, mm-hmm. um, just to get in as good of a mindset as, as possible, whatever that looks like or feels like for any person on a given day, then, you know, cause I know a lot of people worry about like triggers or, you know, just getting 
caught up in things where emotions getting the best of them. And I always say like, if you can just like witness your grief for a few minutes or sit through it and like just sift through those thoughts and yes, it's painful and it can be very uncomfortable. It's, it's not always fun, right? But the more yeah. we can do that, if those things, when and if those things do come up, no guarantee we might not cry or get upset or, or whatever, but mm -hmm. like you were mentioning, it's just however we can regulate our emotions and just like, if those things do come up, it, it might just catch us a little less by surprise, or it might just, you know, it might still affect us, but maybe not quite as catastrophically <laughs> as, as it might've otherwise. And if it does affect us catastrophically, then, then listen, I mean, it's grief that happens, right? <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. I I think that's perfect. The the book ends to your day is a great way to describe that. Yeah, it just you know it 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 makes you more regulated. I mean, yeah. your nervous system is is still, especially after like a traumatic death. It's it's still kind of figuring out like, am I safe? Am I not safe? Yeah. Am I a threat? Um, yeah. So just honoring that and doing things that are supportive of that, because, you know, a phone call in the middle of your day, if you, you know, mm -hmm. didn't, you know, maybe go for a run that would, would bring you back to like baseline and make you feel a little less anxious or sad or whatever, like yeah. that could throw you off for the rest of the day, or that could be something that just is an inconvenience. Yeah. So it's kind of like the difference between suffering and which is optional within the experience or just, you know the normal experience of grief is that you're going to have pain. And that's, that is what it is. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that mentioning that the, the suffering is optional because I feel like people do not believe that, or be, if they are very deep in it, they're like, there's nothing optional about this. Like I am completely out of control right now. So I think some yeah. of the things that we've talked about today, and you've said some really impactful things are just great things to keep in mind. I always say, you know, if something we maybe talk about here doesn't, it feels like too much right now, or it feels too big or too, a little out of reach, just keeping it. I think they're, they're always important things to hear and just keep in the back of our mind. One day it, it will land a little easier <laughs> or it'll be a little mm -hmm. easier to hear. Um, and you're just a great example of someone who has taken this absolutely unimaginable tragedy I don't even want to I don't know if it's like a freak accident or however you want to classify mm -hmm. it but just something yeah. so painfully unpredictable and I've just continued you're just a great example of continuing to to live with it as your your ally and not your your enemy and honoring yeah. it and and just maintaining balance however mm -hmm. we can which I know is very very hard but <laughs> yes yeah yes, exactly yeah, yeah. Winnie, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so, so much for your time. Where can everyone find you? Um, this, again, will all be linked in the show notes, um, your book and all the good things. But uh, if people want to connect with you or give you a follow or even work with you, where can they find you? Yeah, so I am everywhere on social media at Whitney Lynn Allen. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, all the things. Um and if you want to, if you are struggling in your grief journey and need, you know, someone to kind of hold your hand through the process, um, you can go on my website and you can schedule a consultation with me or fill out an application um, and I'll get in contact with you. My book is on Amazon, Runny and Trauma Stilettos, and um, my second book will be out like beginning of 2025. So nice. you can be on the lookout for that as well. Yes. More to come. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Whitney. I really, really appreciate it. This was a beautiful conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps you're taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit lossesbecomegains.com for my blog, membership, more coping tools, ways to work with me, and so much more. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Losses Become Gains, and on Instagram and TikTok at Life With Grief Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your stories, and supporting you however I can. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and share this episode or this podcast with someone who could use it too. And remember to always keep asking yourself, 
How will I turn my losses into gains today? I'll catch you in the next episode.